All right, hello world. This is CS50 on Twitch. My name is Colton Ogden, and I'm joined today by Karim Zidane. So apologies uh, if you've been watching in the live chat. Uh, it took us a little bit to get online. Uh, we're having some difficulties with a brand new setup, but it looks so far to my eye that everything is currently live streaming and, uh, and looks excellent. Let me go ahead and make sure I'm muting everything here on my laptop that the audio is coming from. Um, so, what are you what are you here to talk with us about? You're a regular. You've been in a couple times. We uh, did a, we did like a Travis stream. We did some other stuff. Yep. I think this would be my third stream. Nice. You're a regular, yes. a veteran at this point. Yeah. Um, I guess so. <laughs> what are you uh, What are you talking about today? We're gonna talk a little bit about Flask today, uh, which is a micro web framework. Um, it's used. This is very popular. Um, it's a, a Python framework, and it's used in a lot. Of um, web applications. Online. Nice, nice. So a lot of people in the chat may have programmed in Python before, but maybe not necessarily in the context of web. Yeah. So this is kind of like a nice entry level sort of way to get into like server side programming with Python. Would you say? Yep. Yep. As opposed to maybe like something like Django, would be another technology that folks so, might have heard about. You might say that Django is similar in spirit. Um, it's just, uh, I guess, heavier. Yeah. I, I'm not an expert. Um, um, in Django as well, uh, but, but I mean, it's it's yeah, it's pretty much the same thing. It, it, the job of a web framework in general is you know facilitating um, the process of actually like developing a web app or a dynamic web app. Sure, and this would be um, server side, since uh, as opposed to like maybe JavaScript, CSS, HTML stuff that the web browser actually deals with. We're gonna see a little bit of HTML and CSS as well. We're not gonna see JavaScript, um, but you could you could use JavaScript like. Uh, if you wanted to, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I thought I'd make this as simple as possible and as focused as possible. Um, so we're yeah, we're going to be focused more on the server um, side of things today, um, as well as some templating with Jinja. Cool, awesome! I can't wait. I'm very excited. We have a few a few new followers here in the stream, so I'm going to give some shout outs to them. So thank you very much to AFM01, Negative Nancy, Buffoon Nine, Zombie Raccoon, Cobalt2070. Um, Hossam Farag and Igor Voltaic, thank you so much for following today. Um, I'll transition to your laptop here, so just we, we, uh, bleh, so we can see what we're working with here today. Um, yeah, why don't you uh, get us started here? Cool. So I am inside of my container. Yep. And I thought I would start by talking about um, a little bit of the concepts that were actually a little bit difficult um, for me to sort of grasp, uh, grasp at first when I. Um, first started learning about um, like web, web programming, and some of these concepts is like, like what's a server, what's a client, like how sure, do they sure. like communicate with each other, and the basic idea is that a server is a piece of software that um, is just running, listening um, for web requests, and once it receives a web request, it parses it, processes it, and then if everything is okay it responds with um, some response as we'll soon see. So like some, some program on somebody's computer somewhere yep. that's listening for network traffic, mm -hmm. sort of like p bits of data that are sent to it, it processes them and then sends back a response. Exactly, yes. Um, so yeah, it, uh, uh, exactly as explained. Um, a client on the other hand might be something like a browser which actually initiates or makes a web request and expects a response back from the server, you know, and then, you know, uh, does something with that response, uh, whether it's, you know, for example, showing some web page um, and so on. And so we're, we're going to actually see um, an example of this um, right now. So let's actually get started. Um, so be before we actually start, um, I just want to explain something about the protocol that's uh, being used in this case, sure. and it's the HTTP protocol, and it's exa an example of an application protocol. Okay. And we we'll, we'll see what that means. But for for two pieces of software to communicate with each other, they need to be speaking the same language, right? Right. Yeah. Um, yes, because yeah. you know, if, if if some server is listening for some network traffic or some requests, it expects to receive some data, right? Yeah. You know, if this data is arbitrary. Like it's not going to be easy for the server to sort of make sense of it. Yeah, because someone's it's not speaking a human. French and someone's speaking German. Exactly. It's highly unlikely they're going to understand each other if they don't know the other language. Right? And so there's yeah, there, there's an agreed upon language that they that they both um, speak, and this language is in the form of the protocol um, that is called HTTP. And just to be clear, this is not a programming language. Right. 
Right, um, just a, like sort of a standardized way of, of sending, basically just communication standard like protocol, like you said. Exactly, and, and let's actually see exa an example of this right now. So I'm, I have um, just one file here called uh, index.html, and these are the contents. Let me zoom this in a little bit so we can see better. Um, and these are actually the contents of my index.html, just a simple HTML right, okay. um, file. And then I'm going to start an HTTP server to serve um, this file for me. And then I'm going to make a request. And I'm going to see what I'm sending and what I'm getting back. OK, right? cool. So HTTP server, what is, is that a, what kind of program is that? Does that come stock uh, on Linux? No, HTTP server is actually a node package. Okay. Uh, you can install it. If you have node installed and npm installed, um, you can install it using npm install dash g HTTP server. Ah, OK. And it doesn't have to be the HTTP server. It can be any, any other static web server. Um, but for, for just for, for convenience, this tool is also actually installed already on, on labs and on, on the sandbox environment and also on um, the CFCT IDE. Can people uh, watching right now get access to one of those sandboxes and mess around with Flask themselves? Definitely, yeah. If you, if you go to sandbox.cs50.io, um, you can choose Flask from here. I plugged it in the chat, everybody, the yep. sandbox.csvd.io link. If you want to mess around with Flask but not actually have to install it on your physical machine, um, definitely check that out. Also, Lethal, Shot, GG, M Dober 71 and Man Sunjai. Thank you very much for following. Yep. Um, cool. we'll, have to, we'll have to come back to the chat in just a second. I think maybe once we've... Uh, once we've gotten started, we can read off all the messages. We have a few. We have a little bit of a backlog to catch up to. Yeah. But anyway, you were saying, so we have HTTP server. You set that up using the node package HTTP server. Yes. Um, and then you, you, so now it's running on your machine. So it's kind of listening forever, right, for network traffic? Correct, yeah. And, and for it to be listening, it, ha it has to be listening uh, for, you know, on some port. Right. And you can, you can think of, like pe people often use an analogy for this, I think. Um, you know, different ports correspond to sort of different apartment numbers in, in a building somewhere. Sure. Um, so different ports are used for different services. And by convention, um, you know, HTTP listens on port, like, is, is actually listened to, like, servers listen for HTTP traffic on port 80, um, or HTTPS traffic on port 443, or SSH traffic for on port 22, and so on. So if Jerry um, makes pizzas in room 80, and somebody wants a smoothie, they're going to go to Tom's apartment in exactly. room 81, or I guess what would be S, what's the HTTPS? HTTPS uh, 443. Yeah, they'd go to room 443 instead of room 80, I guess. Yeah, in a, exactly. In a so yes, you would be able to send some data to some port, whether it's open or not. Maybe you get an error if it's not open. Uh, if it is open and some other service or some other, other server is listening on that port for different kind of traffic, it's maybe going to give you a bad response or you know ignore you at all or you know does whatever it right. wants to do. Okay, so different ports are reserved for different purposes. Yes, and by default here, HTTP server actually listens on port um, 8080 as we can see, right? So we're 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 expected to go to um, whatever IP address of our machine is. Call right. 88. And 127001 is usually shorthand for my own computer. Exactly. Local it's a, host. It's a loop pack, uh, it's a loop uh, back uh, IP address. It, it's local host. Yes, it refers to your computer. Right. Um, I'm actually not as familiar with 172.17.02. So this is actually, um, it's, it's a little bit complicated. Uh, Docker uses different, uh, th th there are multiple IP addresses because Docker, like the Docker container that I'm using has a different IP address. I see, okay. Um, and so right now it listens on all IP addresses that this container has, which is the local host IP address and the Docker container's IP address. I see, okay. That's pretty um, cool. So it makes it accessible from both your computer and Docker? Uh, yes, yes. Nice, okay. So you have the server up right now. It says hit Control-C to stop it. Yep. Um, so it's just a regular program, a CLI program. Um, and then now what you're trying to do is test a, actually getting a response from the server. So that's yeah, why you're using curl. I'm just gonna, yeah, I'm just going to make a, a request to that server. Um, and I, I'm, I'm expecting to get a response from the server. Um, and I don't have to use curl for this. You can use your web browser. Um, I'm going to show how to do this in your web browser. Sure. But for now, just you know, for, for the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to try, try curl. And let me resize this just a little bit. OK, so localhost we said, and then colon 8080. Okay. Um, and then hit Enter. And if you notice up here, the request, the, the server actually got something. 
right? Right, yeah. Um, it appears to, to have gotten a... Different color text, too. Exactly, yeah. A get request for slash, and we'll explain that what that means in a moment. Let's scroll back up here a little bit and see what our tool actually did. Uh, so the first thing that our tool did is open the connection to the server. Right. Right. And so then... Curl is kind of like a command line version of, like, using a web browser to go to a URL almost um, yeah. in, a, in a very limited sense. Yeah, curl is essentially a tool that you can use to make network requests, requests like yeah. generally speaking. Um, so yeah, so this is what anything, anything, um, let me actually highlight this so that we can see it better. So all of the, uh, you know, greater than sign something, this is what's being sent or what, what has been sent already. Right. Okay. And everything that follows with a you know, th that's prefixed with a less than sign is actually the response that we got from this. Oh, server. that's cool. Okay, cool. Right. So you I can highlight see the direction of the traffic. Exactly. So I highlighted the request part so that it's easier for us to see, hopefully. Um, and after after curl made a connection to the server, it actually sent these um, lines that we're we're seeing right here. Okay. Um, so the first line is you know get slash hp slash one oh one one point one. And what that means, so there are different kinds of HTTP requests. Okay. We're going to use a couple of them today, get and post. Okay. Um, get is generally used to sort of retrieve resources or retrieve information from a server. Okay. And in this case, we are like wanna... getting some information from exactly. the server. Exactly, yes, yeah. literally, yeah, getting some information from the server. And in this case, by default, you know, since we didn't specify any path after, after um, you know, the 8080 slash, it's going to try to get index.html. OK. Right, or the server is going to try to serve us index.html by default. Right. Um, so this says, hey, we're making a get request, and we're requesting the slash resource in this case. OK, right? so it's like the root. It's kind of like the, the, like the beginning of your hard drive almost, but in an in a abstract sense also like related to websites that might have multiple URLs, like facebook.com slash users slash comments, but yeah, it is to just be like Facebook.com. You may think of it as a path um, in some structure on your on your computer, but it's not always the case that you know this is a path. It can be something arbitrary that's mapped to something else behind yeah, the scenes. Yeah, with the routing and stuff like exactly, that. Exactly, yeah. yes. Um, and so the next bit is HTTP slash 1.1. And what this means is that curl tries to inform the server that, hey, I'm speaking HTTP version 1.1. Right. Just to make sure that they both understand the same version of HTTP. Yeah. In this case. Not, very, not a whole lot of versions of HTTP. Well, you, o only a, it looks like, looks like they've had a fairly limited number of versions. That, that's fair, but for, for the future, maybe, like if this changes. Yeah. If some, yeah. If, 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 if some client or, you know, curl or browser or HTTP, something else. Isn't they coming out with HTTP2? Isn't that a thing? It, it is. I think it is. I, I've never, I, I don't know much about I thought this, I heard so about I that really, at some point. Maybe not. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know much about it, unfortunately. I don't know about the differences. So I, maybe I should look this up after um, and see. Um, but anyway, the point is, you know, that this sort of tries to ensure that they are both speaking the same version of HTTP because different versions can have different um, sort of um, different, I don't know, system of, you know, um, actions or statements or sentences that, that they, they um, might not understand. Sure. And so this just tries to make sure that they're both um, speaking the same version. Okay. The second line here, um, host colon localhost 8080. And this is what's called a request header, right? It's additional data or additional metadata sent as part of the request. Um, and it can be useful for some context. And the context here is that it's not always the case that you can just have one server running on one machine, on the same machine, mm -hmm. right? In other words, you can have more than one server running on the same machine. Sure. And this just tries to make sure that, hey, I'm looking for the server that's on localhost port 8080 specifically. Because there could be another HTTP server listening on 8081 or 8082 or whatever, right? Makes sense, yeah. Okay. Like email servers too, like email servers versus... Email servers that usually uh, listen on port servers. 25, I believe. Yeah, I think that's um, right, yeah. But yeah, so this tries to make it clear that, hey, I'm requesting from this particular server. Um, there's also the context of virtual server. Um, and this is, you know, you can run more than one server on the same machine. Right. They're called virtual servers. Makes sense. Because the, there's also the physical server, the actual hardware server, the computer like, like that's running. V-hosts, too, was like PHP back in the day. Yeah, exactly. I think V-host and virtual servers mean the same yeah, thing. Yeah, I think they're the same thing, yeah. Um, 
The next line here is a user agent, and this is also another request header. And this is just curl try, trying to let the server know that, hey, I am curl that's making this request. Not Chrome, not Firefox, not you know, um, Safari, not Opera. It's curl version, whatever, 761, whatever, if that makes sense. Yeah. OK. Um, although, I mean, you can, you can technically sort of change these headers if you want with some custom options if you want. So this doesn't guarantee that the you know, uh, entity that's making the, or the software that's making the request is actually a curl. Um, I can trick this into think. I, I can trick the server into thinking that what's making the request is actually Chrome or. Kind of how like Verizon like, injected into like mobile uh, traffic. It's like special headers. Yeah. You know, David talked about it in Electra, I think, at one point. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure about Verizon, but um, I, I know some like internet providers do that as well. Like inject some data in the in the headers sometimes. Which makes sense. And Narsal Vivek as, is actually asking, are you guys doing a live stream on Django in the future? Um, and that's a good question. We maybe in the future, yeah. maybe maybe some Django if uh, if people want some Django. And then Salty Glow Stick saying, "Who's teaching who?" The guy on the right asking all the questions. Yeah, I'm uh, very curious about all that Kareem has to has to teach us today. I'm, right. I'm sure we're all going to learn something today. Oh yeah, I'm sure I'm <laughs> going to learn a lot. So that that was all of the request information, and so the what's below that is the response information. Uh, there's right? actually one more header request. Oh, header I see. That we I, missed, okay, which is right. The accept star slash star, and this means that, hey, in the response that you're sending, I'm expecting anything that you send back, okay. pretty much. So a server can send back HTML, it can send back you know, JSON data, it can send back some other binary data. And that's just, you know, we can specify, hey, I'm just expecting HTML, I'm just expecting JSON. Um, and in this case, curl is expecting pretty much anything. Okay. Um, so it's kind, so, of act, kind of acts like a filter almost a little bit? Will it, like, uh, will it get rid of MIME types that don't satisfy that uh, pattern? Uh, so the server actually should handle this. Like the server should see this accept header, um, like look into your header and see what you're asking for. And if the server is able to provide this kind of response, it, it should. Otherwise, it should, you know, provide you with some sort of error that indicates that hey, I don't have this kind of resource available. Makes sense. Ali um, one uh, Ghostwake Dot Mito and Vivek Chahan. Thank you very much for the follows. Appreciate thank it. You. All right, so these are the default request headers that curl seem to be, seems to be sending by default. There are a bunch of others if you want to look at the documentation. Um, there, there are so many other um, um, request headers that we, we can use. Um, and the next part here is the response that we got back from the server. And so the first line says HTTP slash 1.1. And this is just the server saying back that, hey, I speak the same HTTP version. So we know they're speaking the same language at this point. They're exactly. They're saying each other the same thing. Yes. Um, the server also adds 200 OK in this case. And 200 is what's known as an HTTP status code. Mm -hmm. And it's just a numeric code that indicates you know, the status of this um, you know, request or response, okay. uh, whether it was successful or not. Everybody in the chat, uh, the status code that you're most familiar with, go ahead and plug that. <laughs> Don't, and then we'll, we won't spoil it. But I'm sure many of the people in the chat have seen a HTTP status code of a particular variety many times on the web. Yeah. Um, and have just not, oh, actually, Barack said 503. That, that's true. 503 is fairly common. He, it's not as common as another not, very, I mean, very common lots one. Lots of people are mentioning it right yeah, now. Like it's, not, it's not a secret, really. It's yeah, 404. there we go. 404. <laughs> four, someone says 401, though. Someone has, someone's got 401 a few times. 403 as well. Uh, Barack, OK, that was sarcasm. So OK. <laughs> I've definitely seen 503 uh, a handful of times. But yeah. uh, there we go, 418. That's the troll. I'm a teapot. I, I, that is a real one. But it's yeah. not a it's, it's not a very common it's, one. Um, one of them was I think was it that one was an April's Fool at some yep. point mm -hmm. I think by the creators of, of uh, HTTP or yeah. the, the uh, maintainers <laughs> and then uh, Dement zero three zero one that's yeah that's actually a, that's a, a redirect that's also yeah fairly common as well a redirect uh, I think that's that would be permanent redirection yeah. Um, OK, so we have a bunch of others. People are very familiar with uh, different HP status codes yeah. here. So, so you're, teaching, you're preaching to the choir. Everybody yeah, exactly. knows exactly. everything you're talking about. Uh, so I'm not gonna, yeah, I'm not going to be talking about that <laughs> in depth. Um, I guess there's not, nothing to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is, they're actually going to teach you Flask today. This yeah, is be I would a, actually be very interested to learn more <laughs> about this. <laughs> OK, so um, it says 200 OK. Hey, your request, your request was OK. Um, Here's a, val here's a response. Um, it also sends a server response header. 
And what this actually says is, hey, you know, the kind of server that's running is actually this, you know, weird name. It's a very ecstatic, happy. It's a very happy ecstatic three, three, server. Yeah, three three zero. Oh. Um, and some actually, for security reasons, some actually servers or some people choose to configure the servers to not send that. Um, particular header. Yeah, because then they know if you if you have a particular version of a particular server that has a security vulnerability, you've exactly. Kind of, you've, you've kind of uh, you know expressed that to the world. So yeah, maybe making the chances higher higher of someone you know exploiting that. Um, the next um, header here is cache control, and this is a header that says the server is trying to say, to say to the client, hey, you can cache this response for this many seconds, which okay. is you know thirty six hundred, which is like an hour. Um, so the server is essentially saying, hey, don't ask me back the same about the same thing um, within an hour, right. right? And this can be useful, of course, to sort of reduce traffic on, on our servers um, if browsers can cache this data. Yeah. Um, you know, a bunch of other headers, last modified content length is the, you know, actually the size of the file that, that the server is sending back. And in then, bytes, correct? In bytes, yes. Um, here's the mime type that you talked about. Right. And, you know, th there's the content type header, which includes a mime type. And in this, in this case, the type of data that we're sending back is text slash HTML. Right. Um, there, are, there are a bunch of others, too, if you want to check them out. Um, and a couple other headers that we, we won't actually dive into, but you're free to uh, read more on them or other headers online. Um, and following that, following all the headers that we, we got, there's actually the data, which is the body of, of the, the stuff response. that we actually really care the about. The stuff that we actually care about. Yeah. So you can imagine, like this is what's actually this what actually happens when you try to make a request to the same server in your browser. Like it sends these request headers. You don't see all back. of that stuff as, exactly. the, as the end user. You see that, but rendered in a visual format. Ex exactly. So the the browser takes care of all that, parses all the headers, parses the body of the response, and then you know translates it into um, the sort of. Um, Page that you Images see, or and text whatever, and yeah, or whatnot that you end up seeing ultimately. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. Do you know when Professor David will do the next live stream? This is Anku two five five, and then Inda Reddy kindly said he'll be on Friday on the stream for the code review, which is correct. We are indeed having a code review. So anybody that's here in the chat that's not aware, uh, if you go to uh, bitly slash cs fifty twitch code review here, uh, we're accepting source code on GitHub or Gists. And if you want us to review it on stream on Friday with David, David and myself, um, definitely go ahead and toss us your repos. And it's going to be a style slash design review. It's not going to be bug testing or anything like that. So don't ideally send us broken code. Send us uh, working code. And, uh, and this is more catered also towards beginner to intermediate programmers, students who want just a little bit of help with their style, uh, much in the same way that we do you know, sort of CS50 Harvard students uh, style grading. Um, ideally, don't send us P, uh, CS50 PSET repos, just so that we don't have to spoil you know, solutions for students online. Um, but send us all of your repos. Um, that are not CS50, ideally, uh, CS50 PSET related, and we will take a look at it. That should be, yeah, that should be so much fun. Yeah, I'm excited. We have quite a few people that have already submitted, and it, you know, if it does well, we might do more than one episode, but this Friday will be our very first version of that sort of side series for this channel. So very excited to take a look at that. Cool. All right, so I'm, I'm just quick, quickly going to show um, the same thing in, in the browser. So if you, if you visit localhost, um, call 88 in the browser, you should see in the if you open your developer tools by right clicking and then inspect and then you know choosing the networks tab, uh, you should be able to see different information about the request and the response. Pretty much, pretty much the same information. Maybe Chrome includes a couple more request headers, a um, couple of different values for them, but it, it should be essentially the same thing. Right. Okay. And of course, on top of that, you get the page. Uh, render as you expect, which you, so know, you get access to all the same information just in a more user friendly way. Yeah, exactly. Um, cool. All right, so now that we demonstrated this, another thing that I want to talk about is the difference between a static website and a dynamic website. Sure, okay. And what do you think a static website is? A static website to me means a website that if we go to that page, as many times as we want, it's going to show us the exact same content every time. Exactly. And I'll, I mean, also to add to that, you know, if you go to that page or I go to that page, we should technically see the same content. Yeah. It doesn't change Correct. Um, if the user changes. Um, and technically, some websites could use JavaScript and some external APIs to change their contents, you know, maybe per user, maybe per different use cases. Um, so we're not going to worry about that 
for now, I think they would still be static websites since there is no backend that's you know handling something here. Right. Um, a dynamic website, on the other hand, would be so a static website actually, as an example, would be the, doc the documentation for our um, uh, PSET specifications, right? So if Kotlin goes to PSET zero specifications, he will see the same thing as I uh, as I'm seeing right now, yep. right? Um, a dynamic website, on the other on the on the other hand. Will be something like you know Facebook or Twitter or Reddit, whatever. Social. Yeah, it changes every time you refresh. You have all your friends and their posts, all the comments, all the likes. The like number could change. Exactly. The profile pictures of your friends could change. Yeah, different people see different things. You know, I, I see my name on the top right. You see your name on the top right. Yep. Um, people who are not logged in see completely different things, and so on. Um, and so that's often referred to as a dynamic website. A dynamic website is all, also has a back end that's up and running, um, handling different requests, um, as we'll have one today and, and demonstrate and go through something. Um, all right, so let me get out of this and start with actually our first Flask-related example. DM, SMTP, and Salty Glow Stick, thank you very much for the follows as well. Thank you. All right, um, so the first thing that we need to have um, to work with this is, you know, have Python installed. Sure, um, yep, that's going to be important if we're programming in Python, right. anything in Python. I, I, I'm not going to provide instructions on that, but if you go to python.org, whatever the URL is, it should be I think it's python.org. I'll, I'll plug it. Everybody yeah. let me know if that's the correct link. And also, shout out to the regulars, Nuanda, Bella, Bavik, uh, Andre, Whipstreak. Um, there were multiple other ones that we saw up above. Um, we have some new ones, Anku, Dement, um, Indoready, which we mentioned before, and Kloppenberg, who left early, unfortunately. But thanks for popping in, Varani. Um, and then all of the other folks that we mentioned so far. Apologies if I did not catch your name, but thank you very much uh, to all the people that are tuning in right now and have been tuning in so far. All right, so I have Python already installed. Uh, in this case, I have Python um, 3.6.7. Um, I think Python 3 in general should work. Um, and the first thing we need to do to install Flask is, you know, pip3 install Flask, right? And of course, pip3 is not Found because I need to install Pip3. Yep. So Pip3 right. is like a package manager for Python, right? Correct. Yes. It, it's a software that allows you to install, package, remove packages. And um, apt-get is kind of like that, but that's for you for uh, Linux. Uh, for Ubuntu. In oh, for Ubuntu Linux, right? Because uh, Fedora could be. Uh, it's, for, it's also yeah. in a bunch of other distributions. Um, or but Ubuntu, is, I guess, is the most popular one. Um, so I'm right now installing um, Pep3. As you can see. It's a massive installation. <laughs> yeah. And uh, hopefully that should work this time. Pep install Flask and all good. OK, so we now have Flask installed. To verify that, you can you know run Flask Vegetage version, and it should output something. Outputs here. an error. Okay. <laughs> Outputs an error. Um, this is, I mean, ideally, this wouldn't show up on your, um, on your um, computer, but it's actually showing me what to do to fix this error here. So I'm just going to follow this instruction and try again, maybe. Hopefully it won't break this time. OK. Nice. So I just needed to export a couple of environment variables. It's showing me what to do here. So I did it, and it, it worked. This is what you should see uh, when you run Flask that judge version to verify that it was installed correctly. Okay. All right. So I'm going to dive into the first example of the day. And the goal of this example is to sort of visit the same URL that we visited a few seconds ago and a few minutes ago and um, sort of see simply hello okay. uh, as a response. Sure. So nothing fancy. Um, and the way to do that would be, you know, first of all, we need to import Flask with a capital F from Flask, okay. all lowercase. Yep. And we need to create an app, instantiate an app. And this app needs to be passed um, some um, string that sort of identifies that app. Um, if you, I mean, you shouldn't, at the beginning, you shouldn't really worry too much about this. Most people just, you know, pass underscore, underscore, name, underscore, underscore. Yep. Um, so you don't worry about this for now. Um, just instantiate the app the way it is right now. Okay. And the next thing that we see here is add app dot route, you know, um, slash, forward slash. And what do you think? Do you know anything about the at sign in Python? So I know it's a decorator. So it's kind of like a higher order function in Python. A little bit. It's kind of a generalization for it. Um, basically, wraps another function, does some information either before or after it, and returns that function, that wrapped function. Correct. So in, in Python, uh, functions are are um, 
what they call first class objects, I first think. First class objects, yeah. Um, yes. Um, and so a function can be passed to another function as an argument, can be returned from another function as an argument. Yep. And a decorator simply is a function that takes another function yep. as an argument, or takes a function as an argument and returns yep. a function. Yep, exactly. Right? So if you had to guess, like, what does this do in this case? What does this decorator do in this case? Well, in this case, it looks like uh, it's making whatever the function below it does do some value, do some operation, some logic mm -hmm. um, when they get directed to the string that's passed into wrapped. Correct. So Flask actually handles a ton of um, stuff for us uh, for free. And as you mentioned, the way to apply a decorator to a function is you know, using the at sign decorator and then pass it any arguments that it needs. Um, and then right after that, you should just define your function normally. And the way this works is that when this program runs, what's actually gonna happen is that this function, index, is actually gonna pa be passed uh, as an argument to the decorator and another function is going to be returned. Yeah. Presumably that other function has some other logic that wraps around lots of complicated stuff that we hopefully don't want to go through. All the magic, yeah. Exactly. And part of the magic in this case is route handling, as you mentioned. Yeah. So in this case, um, if I receive a request on slash, right? You probably have some global object here that manages all the routing and then that this adds that information to that global object or whatever. So, that can be deferring the function. Yeah, yeah that, that would be my guess. So in this case, if I receive a request on slash, what should we do? We should return hello. Right. So and then the name of the function itself doesn't really matter because all Flask is really doing, I'm guessing, internally is keeping a reference to those function names and using it, uh, managing that on its own. Correct. So it's, it's saying if the user goes to slash, call index, right? Because it, it's mapping it, probably just you, uh, having a direct reference to the function because, like you said, it's first class. So it just really needs to refer to its symbol and then it can call it. I can't remember exactly, but I believe the um, name of the fu function only matters if you use the URL underscore for functionality. Uh, we're I not think, gonna, yeah, I think so, yeah. We're not gonna be using that today, but just for now, for simplicity, um, this name can be anything you want. It can be foo, it can be bar, it can be anything you want. Uh, what actually matters is, you know, the decorator that's before it. Um, Correct. If you have a decorator that, you know, if you have a route on slash, you know, the following function is going to be run when you visit that route. Let's answer a couple questions from the chat. So, uh, Rudraksh uh, Kashyap says, why does mail from the SMTP library go into spam? Do you happen to know offhand? Um, usually, I mean, I, I don't really know much about this, but usually um, sort of mail servers um, have some ways of verifying whether the party that has sent this email is actually legitimate or not. Sure. Like, it, for example, if you use, you know, um, your own web server, your own mail server to send some people some emails, you know, other mail servers upon receiving this email don't really know, um, like, who this server belongs to or whether it's malicious or not. So they usually filter it as spam by default. Makes sense. And if you, um, I can imagine that happening too. If you say that I'm sending email from some message is not actually what the from sender is. You know, if you say I'm sending this from um, coltonoscopy at gmail.com, which yeah. is my email address, but my Flask server isn't going from gmail.com, it's coming from some random server somewhere. <laughs> exactly. It's so probably I, an indicator to Gmail or some other service. Uh, it's yeah. probably illegitimate. You, yeah, you, you, can, you can, as you mentioned, you can spoof email addresses, the phone yeah. email addresses, and make it seem like someone else is sending an email, but, you know, again, some web servers do have ways to handle this, whether by sh you know, filtering it as spam or showing you some icon that says, you know, hit, this is, this might be a malicious email. Sure. Um, but yeah, this, this should be possible. Demed Zero says, first time joining your live stream, the earlier ones you did watched on YouTube, this time decided to join the stream to say hi, Colton and Kareem. All right. Hi awesome. There. Thank you so much, Demet. Really appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in live. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, Andre uh, clarifying about the Debian Linux package manager apt get and Ubuntu and other Debian based distros use it. Um, Verani says, this looks very similar to Express.js. Um, it's been a little while since I've used Express, actually. But I mean, they all, a lot of these sort of micro, these like frameworks, backend framework kind of look similar. The routing kind of looks very similar. Yeah. Uh, it's a common paradigm. Laravel, I think, adopts a very similar, for its PHP framework adopts a similar convention. Correct. Uh, which course do Harvard students use do after CS50? Um, generally, CS51 is the next go-to, and that's like kind of an object-oriented and functional programming course, and there's operating systems and algorithms, data structures, a discrete math course that you took, or the extension version of it. Um, students will take something like that. Which course, what number was that, do you remember? 
Oh, the three math course? Yeah. I think it was CS20 or something. Oh, CS, yeah, yeah, CS20, so yeah. Yeah. Not, that doesn't necessarily go higher number than CS50, but it, uh, yeah, there's, there's a bunch, a whole bunch of different ones. Um, all the CS50 team is doing an amazing job to make these technologies easy to learn and follow. Thank you very much. Please keep doing what you do. Hey, that's a nice compliment. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Demet. Really appreciate it. Um, I also need a CS50 hoodie and t-shirt says Rudrock Kasha. Yeah. yeah, well, if you teach CS50, you can have one of these awesome hoodies, but you gotta, you gotta be, become a staff member. Yeah. Um, it's a dream learning from CS50. Um, also, pro tip, when spoofing an email, make sure you're not auto-appending your signature. Probably. That's okay. Probably, <laughs> probably something you don't want to do. All right. So, let's actually um, test this in action. So, the way to... Um, run this would be you know by navigating to the folder where your application your app.py is in this case and then run flask run and then you know optionally dash p and then the port number that you want to listen on okay um, by default flask listens on port 5000s i prefer using 8080 there's no real difference here um, except that i have this exposed uh, from my container okay. so i'm just going to listen on port 8080 and when you do this Flask has a built-in server. It's actually from another framework, uh, but it has a server that you know starts up and you know starts expecting information on on this um, particular port. I think this is going to fail. Um, <laughs> let me see. Let me Very see optimistic let me, of you. Let me, yeah, I mean, I noticed something that I need to. Okay. Uh, well, uh, is that correct? Do we expect that? Um, oh, because that yeah. says hello, and the yeah. message said hello uh, there in be, the in the web browser. Might be listening on some. Okay, let me. There has to be another server that's listening on this. Uh, let's see. Okay, that's weird. Well, weren't you just using the the server HTTP server uh, in your Docker container? Okay, now now it works as expected. Um, oh, was it caching it? I think it was caching it. Yes. Oh, okay, interesting. All right, so. Um, this doesn't work because um, I'm listening on IP address 127.0.0.1, and I'm inside the container. So for, for my host, it's, it's a little bit confusing. For my host, 127.0.0.1 is the host itself, right. not the container. So what I want to do is listen for actually all IP addresses inside of this container. Again, if you're running this on your host directly, if you're not using Docker, don't worry about this. You shouldn't need this argument. Um, but I'm going to do this for now. And I get what I, what, what, what I expect nice. to get, which is hello. OK. All right. So very simple, very, very easy. Let's switch to the second example that we have today. And this example would essentially expect um, some piece of data um, that can be different from request to request. And then you know returns a response that's different based on that piece of data. Okay. So in this case, I'm expecting a name get parameter um, as we mentioned earlier we can send either get we can send get requests we can send post requests and we can parameterize these requests okay. um, in the sense that we can include um, variables or parameters um, with different values each time right right so in this case I'm expecting a parameter with called name with a name name right literally and with a value presumably the name of the person who's making the request okay right so the way to make a request with a, with a get parameter like this would be as follows. Let's just make sure that the server is running first. Um, so let's run the server on the same port. And now the way to do this would be to append a question mark to the end of your URL mm -hmm. and then mention the name of the variable or the name of your parameter equals its value. So in this case, I'm going to say my name. The key value pairs. Exactly. So name of the parameter equals the value of the parameter, okay. right? And hit enter, and I get hello, cream. Nice. Um, Works very splendidly. So if you did name equals nothing. Correct. Well, that's, 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 a, good, that's a good point. If I don't include this parameter at all, that's hello, a none. buggy. Nice. Right? OK. Uh, and this is because the default value, value of this parameter is none. Right. Or the default value that, um, that requested args so get returns here is actually not for this parameter. What if you did hello equals and then nothing after the equals? Um, yeah, I think it would be the same thing. Uh, would it be would it be an empty string? It would be an empty string, I think. 
Um, so let's let's actually um, let me actually get this running somewhere else. Uh, and also, thank you very much to Vibaga and Rudraksh, uh, Rudraksh Kashyap. I apologize if I butchered that. Uh, thank you both very much for following. 8880. All right. <laughs> um, let me see. Oh, I have to be in the same uh, shell. OK. All right. I didn't think about this before the stream. But anyway, if we did name equals this. Nice. OK, so different, be different behavior. Seed, so, right? okay. so this is a different value, technically. In, yeah. the first, in the first case, in the case where um, the name is not present at all, right. the parameter is not present at all. And so the default value that get returns here is none. Correct. But in this case, there is actually the parameter is present, and there is a value for it, and this value is empty. Right, so it just returns the empty string. Nice. Right. Okay. So there are ways where we we can handle this. Uh, we're not going to worry too much about this right now. Um, the second thing that I wanted to mention about this is that I if I have more than one parameter, mm -hmm. more than one key value pairs, um, they are separated with an ampersand. So if I have you know name equals uh, Colton and email equals you know Colton at CS50 to Harvard Edu. This is how this would be written. Right. Okay. And then you can case. just you could get the more than one variable inside your route just by grabbing the re uh, request.args.get email. Co correct. Yeah. So th this is the way that we get the value of a get parameter called name request.args.get name. And notice that we have to import request from Flask up here as well. Nice. Okay. We have a couple questions in the chat too. Okay. Um, Whipstreak is asking quick question. Does there happen to be a message input into the render template function, which we haven't gotten to yet? Um, we haven't gotten to that part yet. Um, I don't know off, to, off the top of my head. I don't think I've used it before. Uh, but let's actually check the documentation. Uh, let's see. So there is the render template function. Um, I don't see a message. Um, Parameter here, so I don't think I don't think it has one. Yeah, and I think in this case, would you just pass in whatever variables you want, and then have the templating thing sort of take care of? And there's like there's also yeah. like flash messaging, which I think you can integrate into Jinja, can't you? We we are, we're actually going to demonstrate both of these today. Okay. Uh, we're we're going to demonstrate passing data to a template and then you know flashing some messages. Okay. Uh, so if you're curious, uh, stay tuned. Cool, cool. Next question: How would you pass data from the client side, e.g., a JPEG image? To Python Flask server and then return results. Okay, so that, that's that's a different that's a different um, way of doing it. Um, usually, when the data is binary like this, um, it's the case that we make a post request, which is the second kind of request that we're going to talk about. And th essentially, this the data of this image or whatever file you're trying to upload is sort of encoded as part of the request when the browser makes that post request. Um, we're not going to demonstrate uploading files today. Um, but it, it wouldn't be part of the URL, as it's the case with get parameters here. OK. Right? It cool, wouldn't cool. be. Yeah, because that's part of the query string, the get stuff. And that's also st stuff that you can't really put into. I mean, you can binary encode information and put that into a uh, well, or UTF encode information and put that into the URL. But that's not typically what you see, how you see, especially large data. Uh, it's usually done through post requests. Yeah, I think actually URLs also have a maximum length. Yeah, um, I would imagine, yeah. So if you have a file that's big enough that you know, even if you encoded it, um, it would be a problem to send as part of the URL. Yeah. Uh, post requests might be handy in this case. Um, but, 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 but can we override routes, says Bavik Knight? Can we overwrite routes? Um, in which sense? We can have multiple routes. Um, we, I don't think we can have different functions for the same route, because at this point, it would be confusing for yeah. Flask, which function do you want to run in this case? So I can't have another function with you know, um, the same route here. And if you did, I, I would imagine it'd be the bottom one that would take over, it would take precedence. Uh, it could be, because it's, it would be overriding it yeah. in this case. But in this case, it would be useless to have the first one. Yeah, first it would, place. it would, it would. Um, Frame of Ref says, just to clarify, is the request library part of Python or Flask? Yes, the request module is part of Flask in this case. Yeah. Um, it's, it's not a different, it's not a separate um, library or anything. I just installed Flask up to this point. All right. and. The last thing that I wanted to mention before leaving this um, example is this notion over here. And this is actually part of the Python 3.6 uh, syntax, which is a format string. Notice we have an f here, right? And then this is the way I'm sort of injecting the value of the name variable into my response. 
It is so nice. The format string, one of my favorite Python 3.6 features. Yeah, indeed. I, I, Probably my favorite 3.6 feature. <laughs> the three uh, point, I, don't, I don't remember what else 3.6 added that I thought was it's, really great. But. It's, it's really quite handy. Uh, and we're, we're going to see a fairly similar syntax when, we're, when we go into templating, um, which is, I think, starts the next example. Yeah. Right. Do we have any more questions so far? We do. So uh, NACL Eric is asking, is it possible to make an HTTP request from a GUI like Postman if your app is being hosted on a Docker container? Um, yes. Um, and we're, we're not going to dive into details about how Docker works in this case, but essentially you can map ports from the Docker container into the host. Um, and it would be like the client wouldn't really care like where the app is hosted. As far as it's where it could be a server somewhere else, just, yeah, exactly. just a virtual server. Exactly. Um, and then Aldo is asking, is there a schedule somewhere of what you are going to cover in the upcoming streams? Um, we keep all of them as Facebook events, but yeah, in the near future, we are going to start integrating, I think, a schedule into Twitch itself. But you can go to uh, facebook.com slash cs50, and that's where we post all the events for all of our upcoming streams. We also post them to our Reddit and our Twitter account. Facebook.com slash CS50 and then Reddit.com slash R slash CS50, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, slash R slash CS50 and then Twitter.com uh, slash, oops, can't, there we go. Twitter.com slash CS50. Let me make sure that that is indeed accurate. Um, but the simplest way to do it is just to go to Facebook, for now, Facebook.com, I can't type, slash CS50. All of our events are there. All right, cool. All right, that's great. So the next example that we're going to dive into involves some more, some, some templating. Um, Flask, by default, has, as part of it, um, a templating engine uh, called Jinja. Um, and we're going to explore a little bit of the syntax for Jinja today. Um, so this, this following example is a little bit more complicated than the previous one. Um, the first thing that we have here is you know, a route on slash that's handled, hand, handled by rendering a template, apparently, called index.html. And this is what Nate was referring to, Nate being Whipstreak23, when he asked about render template taking a message parameter. In Correct. this case, render template uh, takes in a, looks like a URL to a, uh, an actual HTML page that we might have that we want to serve people, but also takes in some other information. Yeah, and let me actually cl clarify why templating would be useful in this case, or in general. Um, so if you have, if you have a, a website of some sort, and you have a bunch of pages, right? Every HTML page ideally should start by, you know, let's let's open a sample one here. Should start by something like doc type HTML, you know, uh, HTML, oops, HTML, and then HTML closing tag, and then we have you know a, a head, and we have a body, and we have a bunch of other things inside of the head, maybe, and so on. And so it would be really boring to sort of keep copying and pasting this into every page that you have. Yeah. Um, another thing is that you know if you want to change something, if you want to add a script, or if you want to add a um, link a CSS some, some somewhere, uh, or rather in all of them, uh, you'd have to copy and paste that into every page that you have. And so templating sort of solves this problem by you know essentially allowing you to have one base file that you sort of inherit from um, and sort of plug in certain parts, as we'll see. Kind of a common paradigm in, I think, software development, like in general. Correct. Like composable parts, inheritance, like these sort of concepts. I think we, we even use this in the game streams, for example. Yes. Um, state machines, we often, we do that with state machine example, with a base state that other states can inherit from to get like functions that they don't have to write themselves, right? They just copy the functions from other states. Yeah, I mean, inheritance in, in, the, in the context of object-oriented programming is a, a little bit different here, because this is essentially, you can think of it as more of, you know, sort of the same way that you think of a preprocessor, a C preprocessor. It just yeah. literally like, you know, pastes your, your stuff from the base file and then plugs into the stuff that's yeah, very- Yeah, definitely a simpler, um, a simpler implementation here, but yeah. Um, all right, so let's go, so by default, Flask expects all of our templates to be inside of the templates folder. Um, so I'm gonna go into that folder and I'm gonna open the base uh, file, HTML file that I have. And it looks like this. It's called layout.html, and it looks like this. It has all the parts that we um, need for any HTML file in general, the doc type, the HTML, the head, the body, and so on. And it also has this sort of um, curly brace, curly brace notation, and this is actually a Jinja specific syntax. This actually says, you know, 
if there is a keyword argument passed into render template that's whose name is title, replace its value here or plug in its value here. Um, and so let me go back up here and I'm not sure if that's, can I? Make this a little bit more so we can see maybe better. Oh, yeah, we can, um, we can probably me uh, mess with the chat and make it a little smaller. Yeah. Let me do that. Whoa, hey there. All right, just, so. Just briefly. <laughs> make it small, just briefly. So, in the render template call here that I called, I passed in a keyword argument called title and I passed in the value homepage in this case. Right. So, this essentially says that, hey, if there's a title or there's a keyword argument called title passed it to render template, replace its value here or plug in its value at this very same location. Um, and this location happens to be the title of our page in this right. case. So this is like the precursor to really getting us into more dynamic sort of uh, web content. Correct, yes. Um, and so as you can imagine, different calls to render template, as you mentioned, can receive different values for the title. Even if, we take, even if it takes in a name, hello cream versus hello cold, and that's technically a dynamic web page. Correct. Um, um, to answer a couple questions in the chat too, also, yeah. Jubon3 said, I used to do the same thing with PHP, making a header and footer and then having the PHP call it in. Um, yeah, that's kind of what we're doing here. Well, so I mean, it's, it's an idea of what we're doing because um, it's sort of what we're leading to, right? Having a header and a footer that we can inherit from. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can, you can, yeah you can pretty much do that. As and well. then Andre is saying templating is closer to generic programming. Uh, so templating in C++ is not the same thing as templating templates in Jinzo or Flask. In this case, these are just kind of like, pre-created documents that we inject variables into, templating in uh, Java, or it was called generics in Java, templating in C++, those are functions that can take variadic arguments of different types, mm -hmm. and they uh, get compiled into multiple different, um, how, do, how do I want to describe this? They get com uh, compiled into multiple versions of the same function that can take multiple data types. Uh, and they get, this is done at compile time. And then template metaprogramming is related to that, that same thing in C++, where you can, com or you can at compile time, compute a, uh, basically generate a uh, compute table or a lookup table for a series of functions and their outputs, and then get insane performance boost that way, especially in games programming, where you're doing, where you're calling a, a function maybe hundreds of times, um, or rather not hundreds of times a second. Uh, well, I guess hundreds of times a second. Um, no, I guess it couldn't be doing hundreds of times a second. Um, hundreds of times in a loop, maybe, um, over the course of a couple frames or whatever. This is kind of where you'd use templating, but it's completely, yeah, completely separate, I think, from, from this domain, but the same name, templating, just syn not, not, syn not uh, can be used to refer synonymous, to but very, yeah. Uh, yeah, very different use cases, same word. Um, and then Bella Cures is asking, if we don't mention any methods in the route, will Flask answer only to a get request? That is correct. Uh, the default, um, and we're, we're going to explore the methods parameter to the uh, decorator um, here. Um, but yeah, if I just say app.route slash, this is expecting only get requests. Okay. And so what this means, if I try to send another kind of request, or if the, if the browser tries to send another kind of request, the server is going to uh, hopefully re re respond with some error code. Um, in this case, I think it's 405 method not, not allowed or something. Makes sense. And lastly, Adam Fighter says, templates in Jinja 2 are like Python format strings on steroids. Yes, um, kind of. They are a little bit fancy, a little bit more complicated because they involve some um, sort of logic in them that we'll see. True. Um, but the idea is the same, that you have some base and then it has some variables that you can sort of plug, um, plug into and it just becomes different. Um, all right, the next, next interesting uh, piece here is, uh, or, or snippet I should say, is the block, some word, end block um, in that very same syntax. So curly brace, percent sign, block, name, percent sign, and, and so on. Um, and so what this does is actually says that, hey, the templates that are, that, that are gonna extend or inherit from this base um, can essentially define a block and the contents of this block are going to be inserted here. So let's actually take a look at one of these templates. So let's take a look at index.html. Uh, and the first line in index.html is that it extends layout.html, the file that we just looked at. Okay. Right? So everything. So it's going to inject the body block sort of into like that layout.html is kind of like a template that we're saying we're going to put our own block, our own custom block into this placeholder for block, right? So in this case, block body and then the actual layout. Um, defines body and then gets injected into it, right? Yep, exactly. Or so everything index HTML, yeah. in this case, everything from layout to HTML is going to be included in index HTML, 
And the place where this line over here is going to be replaced with the contents of this, sure. which is this line over there. It's pretty cool. We don't, we don't have to write all the HTML head, title, all that stuff nope. in index.html. We're only literally just writing what the body is that we care about. Yeah, and that's the beauty of templating. It makes this stuff really easy. Completely right. unrelated, says Whipstick, how do you check if a text box in HTML is empty using JavaScript? I pulled it up here because I didn't recall offhand. Um, but it looks like with, a, with JavaScript, you can do it pretty easily just by checking um, if a, an element's value.length is equal to 0. Um, I just see exactly, it would be like, oh, would it be document.getElementById and then the input or whatever? I'm trying to find an actual robust thing here. Yeah. Definitely do Google this stuff, though. Um, it can be really handy uh, when you run into a question like this. Like, don't block yourself. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, like I, I, what I did was I typed into Google. I just basically typed in um, check text box HTML empty, and uh, using something like document dot get element by ID or using jQuery, which is the dollar you might have seen the dollar sign library, um, using a whatever selector for your text box. So if you get an ID of like text box, you can check it by the ID by passing in the string with a hash symbol, and then you can basically check to see if value dot um, length on that is equal to zero. And that will, that will mean that it has no characters typed into it, in which case it's empty. So. All right. OK, so let's actually take a look at what, how this looks. So let me um, run my server again. Uh, it's Flask, right? Flask. OK. So let me reload this page. And this is what I see. And just to be clear, let's get back to um, uh, what is it? Flask stream uh, bash. And let me go into Flask stream. I think we're in app two. So this is what I have in my template at the bottom here, right? This is not really interesting. <laughs> so it's, yeah. Okay. So this is what I have here. Same thing. All right, so the idea of very this very sophisticated, by the way. Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, the idea of this of this simple web app is that it would it should allow us to sort of register users. Okay. Right, and we're not gonna ideally like databases are used for this. We're not gonna use a database um, today. Uh, maybe in a future stream we can talk more about database. I believe sure. David had a SQL. Yeah, stream we had a very um, like a, like a SQL basics kind of stream where we just kind of talked about the syntax and SQL Lite, I believe, is what we used. Um, but doing something like Mongo or MySQL in the future would be pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so in this case, today we're not really going to dive into any database stuff, uh, just to make it simple. Um, and what we're going to use instead is a CSV file. And a CSV file is a, essentially a simple text file with comma-separated values. So I can have a file called users.csv in this case. You know, I can say that, hey, the first column is going to be the username, the second column is going to be the password, um, and so I, I can have something like your username. Is that correct? Is that correct? Uh, yeah, see how I did, yeah. Okay. All right, and then your password is, you know, one, two, three. Yep, my, then, my real password, too. Yes. There you go. You and got then, it. You know, another username and then another password and so on. Oh, you're going to use the same password. Yeah, uh, that's a cool well, It's probably should, not very so I secure. I try this on your account sometime. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. Um, the idea of registration in this case is that it would take some data from the user, and then it would essentially insert a row into or a line into this text file okay. in this very same format, yeah. right? Using a very simple database? Yes, correct. So let's actually look at this, um, look at this page here, register. And in this page, we have it's another template called register, and it has a very similar structure to the index.html page. It also extends layout.html. It also fills in the uh, body block in this case. But this time, it fills it up with a form that's going to be submitted to register. And I believe you talked about this in your uh, HTML stream, did you, forms? Um, we talked about it very briefly. That was actually the last part before we kind of had to cut it short. We didn't cool. really get into the nitty gritty of it. But we talked about like user, we talked about kind of like username Password and then buttons and stuff like that. So yeah, we didn't essentially the details of like post and get and all that. Essentially, we have a we have a form here, uh, and this form is going to be submitted to slash register, and we're going to take a look at this code um, after this. 
And this could is, uh, th this this form is actually going to be submitted using the post request method, okay. as opposed to get. Yep, completely different, right? Right. So the again the main difference between including um, HTTP parameters or or variables um, in a get request versus a post request is that when you include HTTP parameters in a get request, they appear as part of the URL. Right. But when you do that using a post request they're actually encoded as part of the request. So you probably don't want to put your password as a get, you know? In a way. Correct, so form submissions usually that includes things like, you know, user, usernames and passwords and, you know, files and other stuff are not typically submitted using get. Right. They're submitting using, submitted using post, but what's a, common, what's a common form that's submitting using get request? Um, a common form, I guess it would be like a, yeah, like a search, I guess. Yeah, yeah. so Google, for example, has a, this essentially is a form with one text field and you know a couple of buttons or whatever, um, and I can search for cats. And if we ignore all the stuff, actually, let's you know what, let's redo this. So I bet if you look at the whole URL, you're eventually going to find something like Q equals cats, <laughs> and it shows the same thing essentially. Right. Right. So this is a form that's submitting submitted using a um, get request. Get request. Right. Because we're not we're not sort of including any really personal identifying information or anything Correct. we need to keep secret. It's kind of all Exactly. And it's not it's not just uh, well I guess it, it is the same thing. Like it, it is mainly because of the secrecy. Uh, but also I don't really want to clutter my history with, you know, all this uh, different values of, you know, some um, sort of files that I have uh, uploaded or, you know, I don't have I don't want to record my password to be in history permanently. Right. Um, so that's that's kind of a bad thing to do. Um, to Andre's point, um, yeah, I mean, templating in this sense and templating in C++ are slightly similar in that there's some like plug and play of things, uh, like injection of, I guess, uh, in the case of templates, you're replacing some placeholder with actual data. And you're doing the same thing with templates in C++, but in C++ you're doing it across multiple different potential use cases and you're sort of creating a table of multiple things, whereas in Jinja you're, you're just injecting it once and then processing it and then returning that one result, right? Um, the purpose of sort of generic programming is to make it possible and more flexible to program with certain data types and in, in, uh, in templating it's to make your, uh, to basically save you from rewriting the same thing over and over again and to kind of just make whatever parts you want in dynamic easy to change, right? Um, Adam Fighter is asking, can you talk a bit about Ajax async calls like for, uh, with Flask, for example, typing your name into a text box and having it print instantly without refreshing the page? Um, that's, that, that I, I don't think we're going to cover this today, unfortunately, uh, but Ajax will be an interesting thing to discuss on in a future stream as well. Yeah. Uh, but the idea is that if you have a backend written on Flask or whatever, as we saw um, in the first couple of examples, we can return essentially any kind of data. So we happen to have returned a string, but you could return a string that's formatted as JSON and then, you know, parse this on the JavaScript side of things and then use it as a JavaScript object. Um, and this is how, like, you know, we, we can dive deep into REST APIs and such. Yeah, um, you'd need a REST API to be able to authenticate, get the information back from the server, and update the page. Unless you want to do it in pure JavaScript, but you still need the authentication to know that that user is actually a legitimate user and not just some random person typing their username. It's so yeah, fairly complicated, but yeah, I think. If, if, we, if we do have enough time, we can demonstrate a quick example on that, on how that works. Um, but I don't have it in my exam in the examples that I have uh, pre-prepared. And already asked, what's the difference between request.form name and request.form.get name? Um, request.form name and request.form.get name. I have not, I mean, my guess, I, I have to look at the documentation for this. I'm not sure if the parameters will be available on the request object right away, like directly. Like, I'm not sure if you will be able to access them this way. But if you are, it could be the case that get allows you to specify this sort of default value, for example. Mm. So I, I, I have to look at the documentation for this one um, and see if that's accurate or not. Can we do functionality for the password? Like when we try sudo, we could see only one bullet, so someone looking over can't guess the length of the password? Like limit the number of characters that the password field reveals to us? Definitely, yes. Um, you, I, I believe you could do this using JavaScript, uh, maybe, or using maybe some built-in attributes into HTML. if. if there's such an attribute that Yeah, exists. there probably is. I haven't actually looked into it, but I would Google um, password limit number of uh, characters, limit number of visible bullets or whatever, 
and there's probably a ton of like Stack Overflow um, snippets that you can copy and paste. Cool. All right, so let's, um, do you have any more questions? No, I think we're all okay. cut up. Okay, cool. Um, so this form is, as you see here, has, um, let's, let's get rid of this, has two um, text fields, essentially. One of them is a plain text field and one of them is a password field um, and a submit button. And these, these are what, what I have here. And the idea is that when I submit this form, the data from this form is going to be submitted to the slash register route, as we see here. And the parameter names in this case are going to correspond to the input element names here. So I'm going to have ideally a parameter called username and a parameter called password right. here. All right, so let's actually try this out. So right now let's actually verify that the file that I have is empty. It's completely empty, it doesn't have any data in it. So if this works as expected, I'm going to sign up myself with some password. Probably not one, two, three, four. Exactly, and this is of course a an internal server error. Oh man, internal server uh, error. Because something, e okay, username zero is out of range. So let's look back at the code and do some live debugging. Oh man, really this is my favorite kind of debugging. Yeah, you know what? Let's actually uh, let me let me do this. Let me make this vertical so that I can see better. Hopefully, uh, flask, stream, bash, and then we're gonna do some live debugging here. So pardon us. Okay, app two. Some live debugging, AKA Stack Overflow. Yeah. <laughs> um, app.py, and what was the error? On line so 33. So list index out of range, row zero is equal to username, so line 33, yeah. Oh, interesting, okay, I know, I know why this is happening. I think because uh, I truncated the file the wrong way. So the file is technically not empty. Um, the file that we saw right here technically has a blank line. Right. Right? But it's not going to have rows that you can parse. Exactly. And so I think one way I can get around this is by doing this. So now it's empty. Okay. Right? So let's try this again. Um, so let me go back to register. Let me do this again. Okay. That works. Nice, cool. It doesn't show anything useful. It shows me the index page again. Right, yeah. But let's check the file one more time. Oops. Users. Ooh, and nice. There's my oh, and there's my password. Spoiler alert. Password exactly. one, two, three. That's something you should never do, actually. Um, <laughs> never store passwords in plain text like this. Yeah, because, encrypt you know, them, yeah. Exactly. They are usually sort of encrypted, as you mentioned, or hashed, yep. um, and then stored as a hash so that if anyone gets access to this file uh, or your database, ideally, um, they wouldn't know what this password is actually yeah. in plain text. But for simplicity today, we're not really going to talk about hashing. We're just going to store it as a plain password. And let's actually verify that this works by you know, registering another user. And let's say you know, Aaron, for example, in this case, and some password. And then you know, verify this again. And we, we, we have to Much more secure password than your password. Correct. It's still pretty easy to brute force. <laughs> Correct. All right. So kind of interesting. What can we do with this, though? Like, what can we do next? Oh, man, um, good going. A whole, whole kind of different directions. Exactly. So now I'm keeping track of some user data. Yeah. Um, I should ideally allow them to log in or, yeah. you know, hopefully show them that they are logged in or not. Um, so, and that's, that's what we're going to do next. And so let me go into app three. And this is going to be a bit more complicated than the previous example, of course. It builds on top of it. Um, and we're going to talk about it, you know, one part at a time. So the first thing that we need to do is actually run the server here. So flask. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm using a library here called flask session. Uh, we're going to talk about sessions soon, um, but I'm using a library called Flask Sessions to keep track of, you know, if the user is logged in or not. And this library is actually ne needs to be installed separately. And so to do this, I'm going to do like I did last time with Flask, but in this case, pip3 install Flask dash session like this, and it should hopefully install without any problems. Okay. Uh, I think this is done. Hey, Sandy, your terminal is just so small. Yeah, so now. I can see. Any, yeah, okay. All right. So now I'm running the servers, no problems, um, which is good. It looks a little bit different. Um, 
the layout file is pretty much the same. Um, there's a couple of things that are different, but I'm going to show. Um, index file is mostly also the same, except that let's actually talk about it. Let's actually look at it. Uh, so tab f um, templates index HTML. So it extends layout HTML like the previous one, except that it has some sort of logic here. Um, first of all, it checks. You know, if there is a username, then show hello and that username, and then show a logout link, right? Otherwise, show hello there and show a login link, right? Or a register link. And this is what I'm seeing right here because I'm not logged in. Make sense? Yep. Okay, so let me try to register myself because this is a different application. We don't have the same file here. So let's do this and hopefully it won't show the 500 again because it might be the same file. Okay, good. So now when I click register, what actually happens is that um, it shows me back that, hey, hello, username, KZDM, my username, and then log out, a logout link, right? And if we look at the file again, we'll find the row that corresponds to my user. So what actually happened here? So when, when the form data was submitted to register, what actually happened is that, let's ignore this first part for, for a second. Um, I should have covered this in a previous example, actually, but I, I forgot to do that. So let's actually talk about it here. So the first thing that happens is that if we get a GET request, what's going to happen is I'm going to render the register template with the title register, right? And this is this does something as simple as rendering the form, the registration form that we saw, right? Otherwise, which means if you get a POST request, um, we are going to try to get the username from the form, we're going to try to get the password from the form, and then we're going to ensure that these actually have some value in them, right? They're not either missing or have an empty value like you did before. Yep. Um, and if that's the case, we're going to abort with an HP status code of 400. Right, so that's not a not found error. This is a different error in this Correct. case. Correct. So 400 is actually a bad method or bad request error. Okay. Um, and some useful description to show the user. This means we didn't give it the right information. The post request was missing some piece of information. Correct. And then we're going to ideally get user gets the row that corresponds to this username. Right, and if there's no such row, the user's uh, actually so it gets the row that corresponds to this username. And if such row exists, that means that we have this username from before, so we can't re-register re it again. Okay. And in this case, we return another 400 with a different descriptive mes message, hopefully. And then after that, if all our checks passed, we start by inserting a row into the user's file yep. that essentially. Um, consists of the username and the password. Okay, got it. All right. Makes sense. So. I think we have a couple things in the chat here as well. Um, okay. Yeah, no, Andre was making, was uh, clarifying about C++ templates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think, I mean, I think the, the, terminolo I, the terminology is, is fairly similar, um, but again, I think the difference between oh. like templates in C++ versus Flask is that C++ is creating an entire lookup table of functions, whereas Flask is its goal is to serve you just one bit of information that gets rendered to you. Um, but yeah, in the same sense that they're injecting, you're injecting sort of placeholder values and then generating some block based on that. Yes, they are. The terminology is similar. Um, are we going to cover Django? Says JL97. Not today. Maybe in a future stream we might cover Django, but today is just on Flask. And Salted Glowstick was saying they, they did some research on why app is equal to flask underscore underscore name. And they're saying the underscore underscore name variable provides the name of the package. And then Flask uses this value to find out what the location of the package is on disk so it can locate other files in the same directory. That is correct. Um, if you, I mean, but we, we're not really going to care about this right now because we're not trying to find files by location relative to this package name or relative to the module name that we're using right now. Mm -hmm. um, but that is a correct explanation, I think. <clears throat> um, I really like these examples. Where can I find them? And then Bella actually linked to your, uh, this, this is correct, right? KZDain slash Flasks uh, dash stream. Yep, that is that's correct. That's today's code. Yeah, so if you want to follow along with all these examples, follow the link that's actually hidden right now. Oh, Kareem is going to plug it right here in the, in the chat. Com slash slash github.com slash KZDain slash Flasks cream. Nice. So all if right. you check that out, clone that. 
Um, it will be good. And then lastly, is there a session on deploying using Docker? He should cover it in a different class, Docker session. And then actually, yeah, we did. Uh, David and I did a very brief Docker tutorial. Not very brief, I should but say. But I think he's asking about deploying web app. applications using Docker. Oh, I see. So yeah. containerizing your web applications. Maybe I don't think I don't think we covered that, but yeah, maybe in the future. So yeah, maybe maybe we could um, demonstrate that using um, Heroku or Elastic Beanstalk or something. Yeah, that could be useful to some people, I think, certainly. All right, so the this part that I just explained in the register function is exactly the same as the previous example, which I forgot to explain. Um, the extra part is actually remembering that the user is logged in or not, which didn't happen in the previous, exa previous example. Okay. And for this, we're going to use something called a session. Right. And so the way a server remembers whether some user is logged in or not is by sort of giving them a unique identifier when they request, when they log in. Right. Right. So in the response, it gives them a unique identifier, a cookie. Right, And then when the browser tries to make another request to the same server, by default, it tries to send that cookie. Okay. Right, And so the server gets that cookie again, gets that identifier again, and knows that, hey, this belongs to this user, and so retrieves all the information about them, information about them and you know, shows that they are logged in in this case, um, and greets them with their user name. And so the way to initialize a Flask to, be, to, to use session is, uh, really simple. So from Flask, we should import session, as we see here, right? And then the package that we are using is actually Flask session, right? And then we're going to instantiate. We're going to import session with a capital S here, and then we're going to instantiate um, the session class that we um, imported, and then pass it app. Um, and so this is the way we initialize the session in this case, or Flask to use to be using sessions in this case. Um, there, there's also a couple of session configurations in this case. I'm using my file system um, as opposed to the, so I'm not storing essentially the data um, on the client side or on, on, on the user's um, computers or on the user's devices. I'm storing the data actually to, on my server, on my file system, and distributing some kind of unique identifier. Um, uh, that re sort of um, references this data. Um, and I just don't want my session to be permanent. I don't want them to last forever in this case. Also, thank you for, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly, FreeFow or FR3Fow, Treetop, and CodeKip. Thank you very much. And so a session essentially ends up being a simple Python dictionary, right? And so to insert a value in that dictionary, we just you, you know use the bracket notation. In this case, we're inserting uh, a key called username with a value username. Okay. And ideally, you, would, you, you can remember pretty much anything here. Um, you can remember. Um, their ID instead, if we have such thing. Unfortunately, we don't use an ID here, but ideally that's the thing that's remembered, a numeric number that um, identifies a user, right? After remembering that the user is logged in after they register, we just redirect them back to index. And when they go to index, this is what's going to happen, right? Let's actually um, take a look first at the index function. And the index renders the index template passes in the title, like last time, and then passes in a username from the session. Right. So if there's a username in the session, this is going to be the value of this keyword argument. Otherwise, it's going to be none. Right. And this is what checks for. If the username exists, show this specific you know, greeting. Um, otherwise, show the sh you know, login or register message. Cool. Makes sense. Makes sense. A lot of session import words in there. Three, three different ones. Yes. That's pretty funny. Um, all right. Jabon was asking, are you going to cover the security issues of sessions? Am I going to cover the security issues of sessions? Uh, not really. Um, I believe they were mentioned once on one of the streams. Um, I mean, the, the, probably the most common security issue with session is called session hijacking. And this happens by means of stealing um, someone's cookies and using right. them, like using them. Using them uh, so you appear to that server as as that person, uh, but you're not. Makes sense. So we're not really gonna go into much more details about this, um, but this is the basic idea. If anybody wants to try and steal deck. Kareem's cookies, yeah, feel free to. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, the logouts uh, function, which happens here when we visit the slash logout, just clears the session. So forgets that the user is logged in and therefore logging them out. 
Okay. Right, so it's, it's simple as that. And, and then redirects back to the, the index page. So if I click this link, I should see the message that appear if no one is logged in again. Correct. Garrison right. Mez, thank you very much for the follow. And then Andre was making a joke. Stealing someone's cookies? What are they, monsters? <laughs> it's cookie monster. Yeah. Well. Can you use JS frameworks with Flask, says uh, Kefa Mutama? Or um, Mutuma? In, in what sense? Um, I, I mean, I know there is there's a, a Flask pr probably has a JavaScript framework. Um, that sort of um, wraps some functionality like the URL for something. I haven't used them much, but yeah, uh, I'm not going to use any today, unfortunately. Um, and if yeah, you're referring to maybe using um, Flask and JavaScript together just in the normal sense, then you yeah. mean, yeah, you can use JavaScript with any backend. They're framework. just run in different contexts. So the yeah. Python code that you have is actually run on the server side, but the JavaScript code is actually run on the Client side or inside of your browser or something, right. um, but yes, I mean if you're referring to any JavaScript framework or any JavaScript in code in general, there there should be no problem uh, using that with a Flask application. Some people are saying that recently there was the cookie uh, session hijacking with Facebook. Major Jafat brought that up, and then some other folks were mentioning that as well. Yeah, I mean some of these issues happen from time to time, um, and you should definitely be careful about that. Um, Unfortunately, we're, we're, I mean, the lecture is not, the, the stream is not, unfortunately, on security, so we're not going to dive too deep into yeah, that. Yep. Um, but it's, it's definitely an interesting thing to look into and, and see how you can protect yourself from doing, like, from exploiting yourself to such attacks. And Bagel Crush, thank you very much for following as well. Thank you. Cool. All right. So let's take a brief look at the get user function that we referred to earlier. And this is just a helper function that essentially opens the CSV files, reads in the rows, and if it found a username with, like if it, found, if it found a username in one of these rows, it returns that row and that's it. And so you could get fancy with CSV files um, and use like a sort of a dictionary or dict reader or dict writer um, and sort of refer to these by, you know, row username or row password if you want. Um, I'm not gonna do that here. Again, typically CSV files are not used for this kind of use case. We're just using them for simplicity. Yep. So I'm just going to go with the numeric index indices in this case. Size Z92 and ML Noob, thank you very much for following. Cool. All right. So now that we have a web application that allows us to register or log in or log out, um, what should we do next? Um, well, they need to see separate information. Uh, when they're logged in, right? We're not. Are we? Are we showing their name so far? Uh, are we showing their name so far? Yes. Okay. We sh this would be like when they log in. I forgot my password. It's one two three, I guess. <laughs> Hard password to do it. Okay. okay, so that's so working. So they should be. Yeah, they, they should see your username once they log in. So I guess maybe some other. Um, so I guess whatever whatever the goal is of this application, which was right. Um, we're uh, probably going to transition to app four, uh, which is I think the last piece of uh, the, the, the last example in, in this in this stream. Uh, but I just wanted to mention quickly that, um, let's see. Uh, I think we talked about all these except login. Login is essentially the same as register, except that it actually gets submitted to the slash login route. And the button is called login instead of register, of course. And if we look at the, if we look at the um, login function or the, the function that handles the slash login route, it's pr also exactly pr pretty much pretty much the same as register as well. If we receive a GET request, we render the login template. Otherwise, we get the username and password from the form and validate them, do th some sort of validation, check that the, we have a record of the user, and check that actually their password matches in this case. And then if that if everything is okay, we just remember them in the session and redirect them back to index. Cool, sounds good. Otherwise, we send a 403, which is. Um, what is it? In unauthorized the username and password. Yeah, I'm, 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 unauthorized. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm trying to remember the. Unauthorized sort of makes sense. That sounds like a, that sounds like something that they would write. So this is another HTTP status code um, that we can send in case the user is trying to do something that's actually that they they're not authorized to do. Right. In other words, Kifa um, Matama is saying use bcrypt for your passwords. Yes, uh, you could you could use any hashing. I, I'm not familiar with bcrypt, but you could use any. Sort of hashing libraries, and I think Python has actually built-in hashing mechanisms. Yeah. So you can you can pretty much do that. I just didn't want to uh, complicate things to f try to focus more on. Oh, uh, it's, for, it's forbidden, is what for Forbidden, is. yes. I'm not unauthorized. It's forbidden. Thank JL ninety seven. How would you prevent against CSRF forms? 
<laughs> okay, so people are trying to drag this into... Um, for cross-site request forgery, yeah. I believe that's what that's short for. Yes. But this Flask has a module for that, isn't it? Or like a built-in feature for that? I CSRF? think some, some browsers... Oh, so, okay, so there are, there are um, different ways to protect against these kinds of attacks. I think some browsers have some built-in mechanisms of sort of preventing some JavaScript from some other origin or domain to yeah. be executed on your domain. Yeah. Um, and so um, I'm not sure if this is a different kind of attack or not, but you know, some sort of um, some web apps sort of include a um, unique token in the form to be submitted um, that's valid for a certain like a specific duration or something. So they, they use that as well. Um, does Flask have something built into it? Yeah, from, it looks like Flask. There's a Flask uh, WTF. Which, interestingly enough, um, what the form? which has a dot CS, yeah, what the form, which has a dot CSRF, and you can import CSRF protect, and then you have to instantiate that, or you have to wrap your app around that, basically, just like you do a session. Yeah, I believe, yeah, I, I mean, I have to look into this more, honestly, but um, I believe it injects some kind of hidden um, sort of input with some unique value that it then verifies so that no one can um, yeah. sort of submit this form. Yeah, you, uh, use a, were, you use a hidden. Yeah, you do. You use a hidden um, form that has this the token injected into it by the server. Yeah, you guys should give an cool. include yeah, a security cool. session. Yeah, well. <laughs> definitely. Yeah, that, that would be a cool idea for uh, for. Uh, David's stream. like an expert on security, so I, I sort of feel like he'd be yeah. great to do a security stream. I'm not that great at security. Um, one day, maybe. Yeah. I'll uh, ask him if he wants to do like a basic security stream because that'd be pretty fun. All right. So the last example that we have today is um, App Four. And F4 essentially builds on top of F3, um, but also adds, let me actually run Flask here, like last time, and then show app here. So it's, it, it, it's mostly the same as app, app, uh, the pie from F3, um, except that, first of all, it adds the flash message. So let me actually show this because this might be useful to show. So if I go back into my F3 folder, I run Flask again, and let's suppose I'm logged in already. If I visit register, oops, register with a lower case. OK, so I added this functionality to F3 as well. It looks so beautiful. This, this message shows up here. You can't actually register a user, or we chose that you can't register a user if you're logged in already. So you must log out first. So this is a flash message that you just included? This is a flash message that's, you know, that appears as um, um, an ordered list item. Uh, and the way this is implemented And so it's is, a list in case you want multiple flash messages? Is that why you chose a list? Correct, yes. Okay. Um, so you can, yeah, you can flash multiple messages and they would, in this case, show as a list. I love that unstyled list. HTML. It looks, it's gorgeous. Yeah, and I hear, I hear you're, you're going to do a stream on CSS soon. Yeah, so tomorrow we're going to do, do a we're going to do a basic HTML uh, a basic CSS stream tomorrow at uh, 1 p.m. So tune in for that if you're if you're curious about a little bit yeah, of uh, CSS. I, I will, as you can see, my my apps are really really ugly. So I I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to watch your stream. Mine are too. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm not I'm not very good at CSS, but I know the basics. So we'll have a nice lovely stream on it tomorrow. Um, um, we'll talk about just some of the basic stuff. We have a little bit of CSS in F4. Um, we're not going to dive deep into that. We're going to leave it to you. Um, but the idea of flash, mes flash messages um, is here. So in the register route, um, if there's a username already in the session, so if there's a username, if there's a user logged in, I'm just going to call flash. And flash is imported from Flask as well. Okay. Right? And then I'm going to pass it some um, string here. In this case, this string has a piece of HTML um, and redirect back to index. Right? And so the effect of that is that this flash, flash message is going to show up in my index page, or any page in this case, because I actually added this logic in layouts. And much like we have um, if statements with Jinja, right. we also have uh, for loops logic Iteration. in this case. So if you read the Flash documentation, you'll find this snippet of code that tells you how to consume your Flash messages. And in this case, you get the get underscore flashed messages. And you check if there are messages. You just loop over them. So the syntax for a for loop in Jinja is fairly similar to the syntax of a for loop in Python. Yeah, it looks pretty much like they took Python and just put it in between, um, with a couple exceptions. Uh, yeah, they put it, it between percent brackets. 
Correct, and there's no call in here. There's no, um, yeah. like the indentation, excuse me, doesn't really matter. So in this case, we have to have um, an int for um, an int if, in case of an if statement. So these are- I like how it has uh, context managers too, though. The with. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's, that's really, really fancy. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm essentially looping through all these messages using uh, loop in Jinja and then, you know, running, displaying or rendering each message, passing it to a Jinja filter, safe, right. because I know my message actually include special characters, include HTML. So it um, HTML escapes. Correct. Okay. So nice. this actually says that, hey, trust this, you know, message. I know that, you know, I know, I know what I'm doing. This is, this has HTML in it. Otherwise, it would actually show the literal HTML. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, so yep, we, we would, sense. yeah, we'd really escape this and so show the angle brackets. So it's actually yeah. not escaping it. It's actually giving it as raw. Yes. Okay. That makes Correct. sense. Correct. Um, all right. So in app four, which is this file right here, we have the same registration logic, the same login and logouts, and the thing that we added. And let's actually run the app four. Um, Surf application. So if I reload this, and actually, okay, I saw a bug here, but never mind. So we see no post, and this is sort of a spoiler, no post yet. That Font's different there too, it looks like. So you got a little bit of styling there. Yeah. I like it. Um, yes. Uh, so oh, did you include Bootstrap? Is that what that I is? I did not. Oh, I, okay. I just you know included some a, a couple of style properties okay. and values. Gotcha. And a little bit of fancy hand handwritten CSS, you know. So let me register you. Um, or register me, really, because I'm going to post on my behalf, right? Oh, what's so on your mind? I so once I'm registered in, I have this, you know, form that looks familiar to um, that of other social media websites, and the idea is that I will be able to, hey, I was, I post something, you know, I was on Colton's stream today. That's right. Or I'm hungry today. Or I'm hungry. Um, and post it, and it would show up oh, like this. Oh, nice. I like that. I like that. Now, is this all client-side at this point? Not really. Um, I, I'm redirecting, this? but it's really fast that it didn't like, take No, but I mean, are you storing these posts in a database? I am. Uh, well, I'm not storing them in a database. I'm storing them in a CSV file oh, okay. like we did. Okay. Um, but ideally, yes, you would be storing them in a database. Interesting. Um, is it a separate database from the, from the registrants? That is correct. Um, so much like you would have a separate table for posts than users, right. I have a separate file here uh, called post to CSV that essentially includes uh, the content of the post, the, the user author, name, the author the of the post, and the timestamp, yes. Okay. Um, and if we take a look at the users, it's exactly in the same format as before, nothing different. Nothing so does fancy. your logic then iterate over the table of posts and just all the ones that have the same username, it'll just output them? That is correct. So let's actually see what happens when we um, see the index page. So when we go to the index page, what's hap what happens is that we render the index.html template, we pass in the title as usual, we pass in the username as usual, and then we pass this extra thing called get post or posts, keyword argument. And the value of that is get posts. So let's take a look at get posts. Right here, we're opening the post CSV files, we're reading all of, the, all of it, and we're sort of returning, like massaging this data and returning it as, an, as, a, as a list in Python. So we take the first cell, in each row and you know pass it as the value of the content key, second cell, author key, and third cell is the date time, right? Otherwise, if there, there, there are no posts, we just return an empty array or empty list. Cool, makes sense. Okay, so. I can see this being very uh, performance heavy if you had like 10 million posts. Definitely, and then this is why. Um, this is why you need a database. This is why you need a database. And we, even if you have a database, this is why you should limit whatever you're showing to the yeah, users. Only like 10 at a time. Because you know, Facebook doesn't show you billions and billions of posts yeah. once you can then. It feels post. like it. <laughs> well, yes. Uh, but it actually asynchronously loads more posts uh, as you scroll down or whatever. Um, so let's actually take a look at the uh, um, index HTML um, template. And if you go to that one, we, the content has a few things that are different in this case. Uh, let me indent this correctly so that um, we can see better. Well, I don't think it would matter. Um, so it shows something similar to before when you're logged in. Hello, username if you're logged in, and then a logout link. But there's also this form right here that's submitted to slash post. Right, that's the text area. The, correct, using the post uh, request method. 
and there's the text area where we type our um, post here. And there's an the amazing placeholder. placeholder message as well. Yeah, well, thank you. I, I, I didn't come. Very, enthusi that from very enthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, and so there's a submit button um, with post on it, right? And so what happens when you submit a form like this? The first thing that happens is that we get the content of the post, and we make sure that there's a user already logged in because we don't want to allow or betray people like anonymous people on the internet to post something. Um, so we, 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 we get the author of the post and we validate that. We see if there is no post, or if the post is empty, show that this is a bad request. If there is no author or if there is no one logged in, show forbidden, right. 403, mm -hmm. with some descriptive uh, messages here. And then we, like we did with, with registering users, we just open the CSV file. We insert a row in this case. The content of this row is the content of the post plus the author, the user who's logged in, and then the current time and date. Cool. And this is how we store this, right? Um, and so this is, I think, all what I have for today. Um, you can, we, we can demonstrate this more. We can have, um, you know, um, it was good. <laughs> Oops. In the case post, anybody was curious. If I reload this page, it should. Nice. Technically, show the same thing. It loads thing. it all at the beginning. That's cool. And so this is the first step on uh, creating a, another social network. Yes, um, <laughs> maybe the next Facebook. Yes. The next, uh, you know, sort of usurper of Facebook. So yeah, I, I hope that was useful for um, a quick introduction to Flask. Today. Yeah, that was awesome. Thank you so much. We'll catch up with all the chat here, and then um, then we'll close it up. Um, people are saying they're waiting for the CSS stream. Should I learn Flask or Django? Says Stambaya. Um, if you don't need Django, Django I think is a bit more um, difficult to use or get start with than Flask, um, at least for me. Um, so if you don't need Django, if you don't have a specific use case that you need Django for, probably start with Flask. Um, easier, simpler, quicker. Frame of ref, where can I keep track of upcoming sessions? Uh, go to facebook.com slash cs50, which I'll type here in the chat. Oops, that's slash. Oops. And if you go to this URL, you can see all the events and videos that we have coming up. Um, but I'm also going to work on getting a schedule integrated into the chat, uh, into the Twitch site as well. So thank you for the question. Are you going to talk about Bootstrap tomorrow, says Bavik. Uh Not Bootstrap tomorrow. No, tomorrow is just going to be raw CSS and pretty simple. Ultimately, if you're already familiar with CSS, it's probably going to be old hat for you. Um, it'll open us up to be able to do a more advanced CSS stream in the future. But no, it's going to be pretty basic. No Bootstrap. Bootstrap will have a, as a separate stream. Um, I get intimidated by CS only tags on CodePen and it's some crazy 3D animation using a ton of CSS as NXL Eric. Well, hate to disappoint you, Eric, but tomorrow we are not going to be doing 3D animation in CSS. Um, I, I wish I was that skillful, but unfortunately I am not. But, you know, maybe in the future if I find somebody here that's just amazing at CSS, we can have a follow on stream which does some of that crazy stuff. Can you be amazing at CSS? Me? Anyone. Oh, can you? Oh, um, yeah. The people on CodePen that do this that do this stuff, I'd say they're probably amazing wow. at CSS. Okay. Uh, Flash vs. Django. Everyone insists I should learn Django for fast development. What are your thoughts on that? Kind of the same question as before, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I could see Django being fast if you're really familiar with it and you ship all the time with it and you have a workflow. But I think if you're brand new to that ecosystem, it's probably more time to get started with Django than Flask because Django is just so much bigger, so much more robust. Um, there's a higher learning curve. Same with Rails, for example, being a pretty a large framework. Uh, does Flask code appear on the browser page source? Says Olaga Semi1376. That's a great question. No, it doesn't. So um, this is actually something that we should have explained. Uh, when you call render template uh, on the server side, what it actually does is that it loads your template, it sort of processes it, so it resolves the extends whatever with the actual base. Uh, HTML5 that we have, it plugs in all the necessary values that we plugged in using our code, and at the end, it produces a big HTML file with um, everything uh, processed and resolved, and what we end up seeing is actually the things that we care about here. So there is no Jinja syntax here, there is no flow, Python specific syntax here, um, all of it is actually the code that we It serves it just like a regular HTML page, looks like it was completely handwritten. Yes. By somebody. So this is often referred to as server side rendering. There's also client side rendering, which is, you know, you can do something like this similar with, you know, a front end framework like React or, um, did we cover React? Brian covered Brian React. Covered, yeah. So you can maybe yeah. look at Brian's stream for, for a React tutorial and see how you can do um, client side rendering as well. 
Um, I'm eager for two sessions, one on databases and two on Heroku slash Docker deployment, says uh, Kifa Mutuma. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, that'd be People are saying that the hardest thing about making APIs is designing your data. Somebody else mentioned um, it was a headache deploying my Flask app on Heroku and connecting the database. So that'd be cool um, to talk about. Yeah, um, yeah we, we, we should, should probably talk about this um, in a future stream. Um, it would be interesting. Um, of course, you can you can do this without any, without Docker at all, or you can do it with Docker and sort of um, make a couple of things easier for yourself since the environments are going to be the same. Um, but yeah, that would be something interesting to look into. And then the hardest thing about making APIs is designing your data again. Yeah, that's an interesting. That'd be interesting to have a, an API stream. Brian did an APIs and ORMs lecture for CSV to be on, so maybe mm -hmm. we'll get him in here for APIs conversation. Yeah. And uh, thank you very much for Rallman and Synet Pro and also Scout969 for the follows, which I appreciate it. Thank you all. Um, ba -ba -ba, let's make sure we're all caught up. Thanks, Kareem the Dream and Colton. There we go. We almost got through the, we almost got through the stream without yeah. it. We almost did it. No, we got it. We got it in there. Yeah, thank you for um, watching this. On forms, should the content type uh, enc type equals be set, says Juban3? Encoding type, I'm guessing that's correct for? Uh, I believe so. Um, yes, I think forms have a default encoding type, but long story short, you can sort of submit the data using different formats. Um, I think the default formats, I can't remember, even remember the name, it's like dub, dub, dub data slash something. Um, and this is the sort of you know key value pair format. So if you have a, an input field with a name, username, and the value foo, it will be submitted as literally username equals foo. But there are other for encoding formats like JSON, for example, where it will be submitted as a key for the JSON object, um, and the value will be the foo. Um, and Andre says, yes, CSV file-based Facebook is the next big thing. I'm sure they'll be very performant. Yeah. <laughs> very performant. Um, wow. Kifa is asking, what, how do you implement upvoting for posts and comments? What's the logic look like? Um, that's a great question. Um, this will be another piece of data that you would have to keep track of. Um, ideally, you don't really want to reload the page, though, when someone you know, upvotes your post. So this will be ideally um, done using an AJAX request. And so the idea of an AJAX request is that you would be sending a request using JavaScript from your browser without actually reloading the page. And the server would receive this request, process it as usual, and then maybe change something in your database or CSV files in this case. Um, so you would have to keep track of some counter. And every time you receive a request for this particular post with an ID, um, you just up this counter by one or down it by one if you're down voting. Um, awesome stream, says Bella. Thank you, Cream and Colton. Thanks, Bella, for tuning in. Much appreciated. Thank, Thank you, you for so the stream, much. says Bavik. Much much appreciated for your attendance. Um, how would someone go about connecting React or another front-end framework to Flask? Will it interfere with the default Jinja templating? Yes, that's a great question. And um, th I, I actually looked into this briefly before, and I don't think there is an ideal way to do this. Uh, like, it's, it's certainly possible. It's just going to give you headaches, because as you mentioned, the syntax for Jinja is going to be uh, problematic with syntax for React. Um, and so ideally, that's why you know, React, like frameworks like React are typically used with, uh, I think, a Node backend. Node backend with an um, API. With so you don't have to, you don't yeah, have to so worry about could use an Express or something. Yeah. Um, well, they usually contain some templating. Um, I guess you could disable that, or you could you know, sort of try to get around it somehow. Yeah. Uh, but you're right, that's a good point. Hello from Belgium, says Senate Pro was wondering what Linux distro Kareem is using. I'm using Ubuntu 18.10, uh, nice. which is the latest version of Ubuntu. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's been working well so far. Cool, looks great. I think that's all the questions. Um, if anybody has any last questions, that would be awesome. Uh, Keith Matama following from Nairobi. Oh, awesome, thank you so much. Great session. Thank you for answering our questions. See you tomorrow, says Keith. Yep, see you tomorrow thank for you so some much. CSS. Yeah, um, we'll stick around for just a couple more minutes in case anybody has any last questions and then. Otherwise, we will bid you adieu and we'll see you tomorrow, or at least I will see you tomorrow for some CSS, and then the day after, we will review your source code uh, live on Twitch. So that'll be a lot of fun. That, yeah, that's, yeah, that's exciting. We've got to get you in here again for another stream, too. Hopefully, yes. <laughs> and as always, uh, many of you have been contributing your ideas fantastically, so keep doing that. We want to hear all of your ideas for future streams um, so we can keep producing some awesome content. So any topics, anything you want us to build, anything you want us to talk about, that would be nice. JL is asking, where did you submit the code? Um, so you want to plug your repo in there one No, more I think he's asking about the code review thing. Oh, right, 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 right. Um, so that is at bit.ly slash cs50 twitch 
code review. And then frame of ref included a longer, the longer URL that that bit.ly actually maps to. Um, but you can go to either of those, and there will be a form asking you for your GitHub or your GIST, um, your GitHub repo or a GIST link so that we can look at it, make sure that it's um, ideally not a CS50P set so that we don't spoil the solution for anybody online. Um, also, it's more catered, again, towards beginner or intermediate programmers. Not, uh, it's not meant for bug testing. So if you have any bugs, we won't be debugging your code live on stream. But we will answer um, any style questions you might have. Um, we will be looking at the style, critiquing it, critiquing the design, making sure that it's well implemented, well formatted. Um, and regardless of your experience level, you know, submit it. But again, it's more catered towards folks that, are, that don't necessarily know maybe how best to style or design their code yet and are just kind of beginning. Uh, just as adding extra spaces in the code, any way to solve it, says Indra Ready 5? If you're using GitHub's um, GIST feature, um, I think there's a way to configure. When you're creating a GIST, it, al it allows you to choose the number of spaces to use for indentation. Sure. So if you're using two or whatever, um, make sure to choose that. Maybe. Yeah, and if you're, if you're copying and pasting in the middle of your code base, that might also be screwing up the spacing a little bit. So you just want to kind of, you can copy it to another file and shift tab it back to where it's uh, flush with the left side. Um, Ideally, the, uh, the, the snippet should have some context, so maybe and just include the whole function or the whole body. Um, but you know, either way, send us what you have, and if, it's, if we can work with it, we'll give it our best shot. Senate Pro, thank you as always. You're wonderful. Thanks so much, Senate Pro. Much appreciated. Um, but I think that's it. I think we're all caught up. So thanks to everybody who tuned in live today. This was Flask. Thanks to Kareem yeah, for this wonderful for stream. Me. We built a very simple social network of, of sorts. Uh, more, like a, more like a blog at this point, it looks yeah, like. Um, but yeah, no, it was, it was awesome. So we got to cover Flask. So if you're looking to get into back end programming with Python, this is a good starting point. Um, tomorrow, join us for front end, more front end stuff. So last week we did HTML, or two weeks ago we did HTML. This week we're going to do CSS. Tomorrow we're going to do CSS, cascading style sheets, the basics again. I'm not an expert. I'm not going to wow you with my amazing CSS skills because I don't have amazing CSS skills, but I will get you on the right track if you are an aspiring web developer. So thanks so much, everybody, once again. This was CS50 on Twitch with Kareem and Flask. I will see you all tomorrow. Bye-bye. <laughs>